So welcome to the podcast, John. It's brilliant to have you today. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, Rob. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Looking forward to having a chat and uh, telling, uh, telling people what we've been up to. So for those who haven't come across you and your research and the other bits and bobs that you've done, give us a bit of a background to how you fell into the, the industry of sport as a youngster and, and how that's kind of taken your imagination to where you are today. I think uh, from, from my point of view, I can't, I can't really think of a time where sport wasn't a big part of my life. Um, I genuinely wouldn't know what else to do if I wasn't working in sport. So kind of growing up, um, my dad was a PE teacher um, and he, he played a lot of sport growing up. So from an early age, it was kind of thrown upon me, um, for want of a better word, um, but kind of jumped in, played everything. Very, very average at, at most things um, before kind of sticking with rugby, um, mainly playing rugby throughout kind of my younger younger teens and and up through university where I decided to play a little bit of rugby league um, before kind of finishing up kind of five years ago and then uh, deciding to come out of retirement and, and play football now. So uh, kind of getting towards uh, a vet's age and looking forward to 35 because then they might be about my kind of speed, which would be nice. Um, but yeah, no, no high performance this end, just all more from a, from a teaching background and just really, really loving sport um, and getting into it that way. And um, kind of finishing up at, at college, uh, thinking, geez, what, what am I going to do? Um, I need to work in sport. So so studied sports science at, at the University of Gloucestershire and um, enjoyed it. But Coming to the coming to kind of the start of third year, I wasn't really sure what was going to happen next. Um, they're quite broad degrees, sports science degrees, and I know that's kind of the only thing that was around um, when I went to uni, kind of twelve years ago. Um, but it just wasn't practical enough for me. I, I didn't enjoy um, kind of sitting down, being in a lab environment. I wanted the interaction with athletes. Um, so coming towards the, the end of second year, start of third year, looking at, at what next, it was, do I debate PGCE? Do I want to be the uh, following dad's footsteps and, and be a PE teacher? Or, or is it more of a, a sports coaching uh, route I want to go down? Because I loved coaching. I'd always coached um, football, rugby, working with, working with young athletes. And it was only in my third year when Roger Lloyd came across from uh, finishing his PhD at Cardiff Met. He took the, the lecturing role at, at Gloucestershire Uni. And uh, he delivered our, our first insight into s and um, which was a, a module in third year. And I thought, wow, this is, this is what I want to do. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Um, liked the idea of working closer with athletes than just kind of a performance testing um, background um, that we were kind of being pushed down in a sports science route. Um, and Rodri then set up the, the master's degree at Gloucester. So I stayed there, um, did the master's. Um, and kind of from, from there, it was youth, youth SNC was, was where I wanted to go. So um, worked at Exit City Academy um, whilst uh, doing my master's. Um, worked, actually worked with, with Andy Taylor, who I know you had on a couple of weeks ago. Um, I went down to Overbridge College. Uh, so Andy worked very closely with, with Wayne Carlisle uh, down at Ivybridge. And Wayne was also the under 16s coach at Exeter. And he said, look, you've got, you've got to come down. You've got to spend time with Andy. Uh, so that was great. That was a really good kind of, uh, kind of eight, eight months uh, kind of spent in and around with, with Andy down at Ivy Bridge, learning a ton from him. Um, and then finishing a master's, uh, kind of um, finished up at Exeter. I needed something new. Um, so got an assistant academy role at Exeter Chiefs, um, which was brilliant. So didn't spend long there, kind of eight, eight months there. And, and Rodri came to me and said, look, I've got a PhD opportunity at Cardiff Met. Are you interested in this? And it was, yes, I am. I want to do a PhD. I, I knew at that point I wanted to lecture. Um, my dad had put me off being a teacher, but I felt lecturing was going to be, well, actually, they want to be at university rather than having to teach kind of 11 to, to 18 year olds who don't want to be there. They don't want to play football in the pouring rain. Um, he kind of talked me out of that. But I'd kind of worked out, I knew I wanted to lecture, so I thought, PhD, that, that's a good way in. Um, but it was so tough to leave Chiefs. I felt like I was really starting to get somewhere in, in my practitioner career. Um, the uh, academy manager, Rob Gibson, was, was fantastic. He had such a big portfolio of players we'd worked with. 
Um, the, the first team SNC guys at Chiefs, Mark Twiggs heading it up with James Parks and Rob Bedard was superb. And I thought this is going to be tough to, to walk away from. Um, but I sat down with Rob Gibson and, and he said, look, like the first team SNC coaches, they're not leaving. They're, like they all like Chiefs. It, it's a good place for them to be. Like they're, they're probably not going to leave. So there's not really a route up for you at the moment. And he's not wrong because all of those guys are still there uh, 12 years later. So, well, no, seven years later. So I think I made the right decision uh, to go to Cardiff Matt. Did the PhD midway through, got the lecturing job. Um, and here I am kind of five years ago, um, which just feels like a, a couple of weeks ago that I came to Cardiff Matt. Um, but yeah, five years ago and uh, now finished up the PhD last year and, uh, and still lecturing. So you obviously mentioned it was quite a tough decision to, to break away from, from the Chiefs. So what was it about doing a PhD and stepping into lecture that really kind of got your, your motor running? I think it was, well, it was, it was the funded opportunity I knew was going to be big. Um, there wasn't a ton of funded PhD opportunities at the time. Um, I'd actually been in conversation with John Cronin at AUT in New Zealand, trying to sort out a PhD over there. And um, we been in a similar area of lack of funding um, so we were looking at funding outputs in terms of initially it was a girls school um, that actually stepped away in the end then it was tennis New Zealand and, and it was that, that idea of right I'm ready to go but um, funding is, is the issue so it was it was the idea that I knew I wanted to do a PhD because I kind of had felt that to get into lecturing you need to have a PhD um, it was kind of transitioning that way um, and it was the opportunity of one working with Rodri. Um, I had a really good working relationship with him through through my masters um, in an area that I was really interested in and funded. I kind of thought, can I turn this down? Uh, um, and I couldn't. I couldn't turn it down, and I don't regret it at all. Um, I remember. Uh, I sat down with John Hughes actually, um, who is still. Um, a senior lecturer at University of Gloucestershire and he took over from Rodri when Rodri moved back to Cardiff Met to lecture John Hughes came in and I sat down with him and he said look a PhD three years that that's three years that you could spend and you could really go far in your practitioner career um and I said I know but I can't turn down this opportunity and he said no I think I completely agree like at the end of your PhD you can then go and become a practitioner again if that's still what you want to do um and yeah, I, I, I made the right decision. I, I kind of, it's, it's something that I knew I wanted to do, but it was still a really tough decision to leave Exeter. Um, but yeah. So what you obviously mentioned, that, you know, it's a great opportunity being funded, but also the area of research. So obviously the, the area of research being in the kind of pediatric domain and the youth domain, that, that was something that was of interest to you as well? Yeah, like it's, it's difficult not to when you've been around Rodri. Um, he's incredibly passionate about it. He's incredibly knowledgeable and it, it's difficult not to kind of fall into that with him there. Um, and it was an area, like, like I said, I, I kind of wanted to teach, but my dad put me off it. Um, I'd been uh, coaching young footballers, young rugby players. I'd been teaching swimming and I just felt it's, it's an age group where um, we can make a massive difference, um, not just in things like physical performance, but just in terms of their whole kind of life, in, in terms of life lessons at, at that age, and just the enjoyment of, of working with, with kids, of, uh, just something, uh, they bring something different every day. Um, and it was kind of quite a novel area. Uh, Rodri had kind of just started pushing the boundaries. He'd obviously uh, kind of jumped on board with, with things that Avery Fagenbaum was doing in, in the States and, and Greg Meyer. And it was kind of just taken off. And I thought, actually, yeah, this, this is an area that I'd, I'd like, to, like to get involved with. Um, I'd done a couple of research projects uh, while on the masters. Um, so I did a research project with, with the Exeter, Exeter guys. Um, and then my, my uh, master's dissertation was, was a training study in, in young kids. So I've been exposed to it, enjoyed it. I felt it was a really interesting area. And, and this was kind of the PhD. I looked at it as Roger was trying to push even more boundaries with it. It was, very much mechanistic, very much uh, real science. And it was something that I thought, yeah, actually, we need to know that. And I think I can help answer that. And it was it was definitely a subject area that I was interested in. 
So you obviously already mentioned your dad being a pivotal figure, maybe in terms of influencing you away from PE teaching or but even in sport in general and Rodri being a kind of central figure in, in pushing in the direction. Is there any other people that have been influential in shaping your coaching journey or your journey as a researcher? Yeah, I think um, like my, my dad obviously had a huge influence and I don't think he realised that growing up that like, he literally drove me all around the country playing rugby, uh, swimming, um, whilst he was balancing work at, at home as well. And it's not easy for a PE teacher because he had kind of seven, eight other teams he was looking after on a weekday. So that, that was a massive influence. And, and he obviously gave me a massive insight into sport initially. Um, but I think one of the the biggest um, well, one of the biggest eye openers was when I started at Exeter City, who are obviously a professional team but in League Two, and they obviously have limited funds. But the way their academy was run by Simon Hayward, who was head of academy, was so professional, um, and it just opened my eyes to what really like kind of top end sport could be I thought well if this is if this is what's run at League Two imagine the Premiership Academies and um, it was something that I think I've always taken away like just just simple things such as the players coming in and, and when they speak to you eye contact when they meet you handshake um, I think like just having been around the kind of culture that Simon wanted at Exeter Academy was massive and he was what what he always talked about was trying to develop good people as well as good players that was a big thing for Exeter knowing that probably 70-80% of the academy players weren't going to get pro contracts it was can we actually set them up to be successful in, in anything else and just teach them those kind of people skills those social skills was was huge so he was he was great to kind of be around um Andy Proctor was probably my first mentor so he's uh, head of sports science uh and medicine at Bristol City now um so I worked with him at, at Exeter he was uh, head academy physio and he taught me so much about um kind of player engagement um it was the idea of if you can get the players to do a bit more than what they did yesterday, I'll be really happy. It wasn't the idea of let's overhaul the whole program. It was if they do nothing, can we just do a decent warm up this time? Right. If they've done a decent warm up, can we extend that warm up by five minutes? And it was his ways of actually getting the players on board. Like footballs, are, it's, they're, they're notorious for not for not enjoying. Um, maybe I'm grouping everybody there. Um, tying them with the same brush but they are kind of notorious for not enjoying it and I think the, the academy boys at Exeter were, were the same they just wanted to play head tennis or they just wanted to play five side we just want to play matches but uh, Andy's buy-in was great the, the rapport he had with the athletes was brilliant um, so that was great to see I got a ton of coaching experience with, with him at Exeter he kind of said look do what you want to do um, I'll, I'll help you and, and we can roll with that um, and then obviously at Exeter, I didn't spend long there, but but those guys saw them saw them occasionally and, and learned bits from each of them. Um, kind of Mark Twiggs, how to run a high performance program, um, knowing what he needs to do for, for his team of coaches to be successful was, was great to see. Um, but then obviously most of the time I spent at Cardiff Met. Rodri has been massive. Um, kind of met Rodri in what 2011, so worked with him for nearly 10 years. Um, been a huge influence. Um, both kind of personally and professionally. Uh, John Oliver um, is just an absolute genius. Um, just every, like I've worked with John since the start of my PhD, so that would have been 2014. And like every day, he just surprises me with, with questions that he's got. And the way his brain works is just different to anybody I've ever met. He is, he just sees data and says, oh, let's look at this. Where did you get to that from? Um, just an absolute genius so he's been hugely influential from a kind of researcher point of view um working at the ypd center um coaching closely with with Syl Moosecops, tom matthews and steph morris um if you can find me three better coaches of youth athletes um then fair play because you'll be looking for quite a while They're absolutely fantastic with such a like diverse skill set but but still like complement each other really well um so it, it was great to work with them um for many a year and um and then i've been really lucky it's got a kind of in quite a nice position um i've, I've always coached um whilst, whilst being at cardiff met so my last role was was head of snc for welsh rowing 
and I've been able to kind of handpick the best students to intern under me. Um, so I've had kind of Rich Walters, Ned Partridge, uh, Harry, Harry Wright, Jack Palmer, all fantastic young coaches that have gone on to do really good things in SNC. And I'm now ringing them up and saying, look, guys, I need to run this past you. Like, what would you do in this situation? Which that's always nice to see, um, see kind of old students come through. And, and now I'm thinking, geez, I need to speak to these guys because they're so good. So, yeah, I think uh, seem to have been influenced quite a lot by a lot of people, but all, all in kind of different areas and, and, and different things. So I, I don't think... I've never had a real like specific kind of mentor. The roles I've worked in, I've never really had a senior s &C coach work directly above me. And I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing. I guess it's a bad thing most of the time, but I've had to make mistakes and learn from myself. And I'm quite critical anyway. Uh, but the kind of consistent thread throughout has always been Rodri that I've always been able to go back to him with to say, look, Roger, I've tried this with the footballers, like, what would you suggest? So while he hasn't sat above me directly from a practitioner point of view, I've always been able to bounce those ideas off him, which has been brilliant. Mm, fantastic. So if you were to try and, I guess, describe how your, your philosophy has kind of evolved over, I guess, both coaching and, and research, where would you kind of describe your philosophy as being at the moment in terms of coaching young athletes? I think... Um, it's it's probably changed a little bit more recently where I think I've started to look at maybe more of like the bigger picture. Um, just from a general SNC point of view, I think when I started really in, in, in SNC kind of nine years ago, it was well, SNC is everything. If you win on a Saturday, it's because of SNC. If you lose on a Saturday, it's because of SNC. And Honestly, it's only the last few years where I've realised we probably don't have much to do with that at all. Um, we have aspects to do with it. Uh, um, and I think a good programme can complement a lot to, to teams, which is why SNC is still a profession. But it's a lot less of a big deal than what I think we initially thought and certainly I initially thought. And I think the same thing is kind of the case with where I've got to with youth athletes, where initially it was all... Well, I want to work with youth athletes who are going to be professional athletes to now look at that and say, well, actually there's not many of those. There's not many of the kids I work with are going to be Premier League footballers or international rugby players, or are going to play for team bath netball. Like it, it doesn't really happen that much. So I think I've started to look at the big picture to say, well, how can I actually positively influence these young kids in general life, not just as an athlete and, starting to look at this idea of the the bigger picture of snc um even the bigger picture of sport like socially um it, it's the way like we've just had our induction day and and i said to the first years look are you getting involved in sport and most of them said yeah and i said well i'd encourage it because that's how we make friends like you're coming away to university you don't know many people go and join one of the local clubs you'll make friends and that's a big part of, of kind of youth um growing up and and the kind of um like the social skills sport can teach so it's just encouraging that that encourage them to to have fun and make friendships and um actually start to understand this collaborative and learn and share and, and things like that i think i think it's been been big teaching them to be good people um looking at more of a health benefit i think um looking at especially now i think we're, we're kind of following in the u.s footsteps in, in not a good way and Avery's big on this and, and it's difficult not to listen to Avery and be inspired um, that we need to start doing something about health and if kids move better they will play more sport so can I teach kids to move better to, to then as they move up into adulthood they will continue to play sport um, regardless of whether they made it as a pro um, so it's it's can, can we actually engage them in physical activity during the younger ages because research has kind of shown that that's going to continue into their adult adult life. So I think big picture, that's kind of what I've started to look at more recently. But from a maybe more of like a performance point of view, I think um, one of the big ones that I, I didn't realise this, this ended up actually being quite catchy. I Looking at what you'd sent through, I thought I need to have a think about some of these questions. And this one I started to think about, well, for, for me, three words that kind of encapsulate what we're trying to do is educate, infuse, and en enhance. And we need to educate the kids to understand what they're doing. I think that's really, really important. If we're trying to bring kind of lifelong physical activity to these, to these kids, they need to understand the, the benefit of it. They need to understand the rationale behind training, but as well as 
um, what they need to be doing. So I think Rodri gave a really nice example in, in his podcast with you where he talked about what Silv Muscops had done with the young gymnasts, just teaching them how to set the bar, how to put clips on, simple things like that. And, and Tom Matthews does such a good job with, with the young tennis players he works with. Um, in fact, it's got so far that I don't think he coaches anymore. He gets the kids to coach each other and he just takes that step back and, and kind of starts off the, the session with, can you give me three points of the technical one of the squat and actually starts to educate those so that when they're on their own in, in 10, 15 years and they don't have part of this SNC support, they can still train themselves safely. Um, so I think education is massive. I think the, the idea behind Enfuse is we, we need kids to enjoy themselves that's that's the reason they come to our snc sessions because of enjoyment yeah, that's we, we can't get away from that fact if they enjoy it they're going to come back and um whether fun sessions is playing games or whether it's just enjoyment out of adding an extra five kilos to the bar whatever actually starts to infuse them um and i think we play a big role in that with with the rapport we build but i think targeted to that we cannot get away from what we're trying to do which is kind of enhance enhance them it is strengthen them so that we can either make them better at sport or, or reduce injury and i think we're, we're close to going down a little bit of a rabbit warren in snc where it is just all that fun it's just let's just play a game and it's like well, we actually still need a learning objective we still need to make sure we do our job so yes it needs to be enjoyable yes it needs to be fun yes we need that so that they come back again next week but we've also got a job to do and we need to make sure that we still have that kind of learning objective um, and we actually hit hit those objectives throughout the session um, so that's a big one for me but kind of sum it up I, I guess it's just looking at that what we do in the gym is isn't the kind of end goal um, if 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 we can help a, a kid become um, or have a better relationship with, with physical activity, cool. Um, but from a performance point of view, um, I think we are going to have a limited direct influence on performance. Um, and it's having that understanding of what we can actually kind of give them um is important so yeah i think for me it's it's been kind of philosophy changed the last couple of years it's been this big picture just taking a step back and saying actually what impact am i having no, that's really good i like that educate enthuse enhance i didn't realize notes. it was but they, they they do tick a box for me and i was like oh no i'm, I'm coining new terms but <laughs> it, it, it just i think I think we have to be, we, we've just done a, a paper that is going to be in SCJ, um, I think around Christmas time. Um, and it's a full kind of YPD group effort. And I think it's a cracking paper. It's all about um, developing athletic motor skill competencies. And in there, we talk about kind of structured ways and unstructured ways. And the stuff we see on social media, like Jeremy Frisch does some brilliant things, but if people take that out of context, it can just become weird. Like, let's just play games with kids, just play games and they'll get everything. And it's not that, it's we need learning objectives. We need structured training as well as the unstructured stuff. And can we structure the unstructured stuff in a way as well? And I think that's really important. And it's a big thing that we talk about um, in the YPD Centre where it's, yeah can we can we give some structure to the unstructured stuff so that we can still learn as well as have fun mm. i think that's a big um it's one of the kind of challenges i guess of the social media era is people see something and they just copy and paste it without knowing whereas you know i was chatting to brett cleaker a few weeks ago and he was saying you know if you saw one of the sessions it would look unstructured but if you ask the coach why we're doing that they could give you a solid rationale for why we're doing this and i think that's the difference isn't it if you ask jeremy yeah. frisch why are you doing that he's like well i'm working on single leg landing so i'm working on vaulting whereas someone else you just copy and paste that doesn't have that underpinning rationale and it's just well it looks good exactly and twitter what is it 120 characters or whatever it is yeah. you, you can't give your full rationale and it is it's it, like I, tom normally says he, he says look if i put videos up of, of everything i did it'd be boring Mm -hmm. uh, but he said, or oh, I could video the five minutes at the end where we do have an unstructured game and people are like, oh, wow, what they're doing at Cardiff Met is great. It's like, actually, no, the good stuff's what comes before, but nobody yeah. wants to see a, a kid just backslide. But yeah, that was the yeah. carrot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. That, there's a time and place for everything, but I think it's important that no matter what you do, we still have learning objectives that they need to hit. And like you say, whether that's the whole theme of the session is based around single leg landing uh, um, and kind of 50% of that makes up an unstructured game, cool we've got a learning objective but yeah it's just making sure that we don't go too far down that rabbit warren of 
let's just have fun. Mm. So let's dive into your research. So obviously your PhD was all centered around, you know, um, the pediatric population and, and maturation and how that affects both kind of the form and, and function of, of, you know, maturing bodies. So give us a bit of an overview, I guess you can kind of go you know, piece by piece through some of those studies or give us a general kind of perspective, but give us a bit of insight into what you were looking at and, and what your kind of conclusions were. So I, I guess the, the, the main thing that we were looking at is, is kind of stretch short in cycle development. And, and that was a uh, kind of Rodri's focus through how, throughout his PhD of how does the stretch short in cycle develop um, across maturation and what he wanted to do with with my PhD and where we wanted to take it was more down um, like why why is that happening so okay kids jump higher um, they they get a better reactive strength index they get better leg stiffness but why what what are the mechanisms that are actually underpinning that um, so that was the big one so so we looked at um, Kind of the influence of growth and maturation on muscle architecture and how that influences the stretch shortening cycle uh, so that was the the kind of main main goal um and uh kind of working a little bit through the thesis we what what i think we we'd looked at is that we don't know at the moment how much growth and maturation influences things versus how much training influences things so it was almost that idea of we actually need to take a step back and say, look, right now, let's maybe forget about training and let's have a look at if we just don't do anything with these kids, naturally, what happens? So you obviously can't control everything. They obviously still did things like PE, they played their sport. But what we wanted to look at was, was just how does growth and maturation affect that? So initially, we looked at kind of cross-sectionally. Um, we looked at a, a pre um peak height velocity group, uh, a circuit peak height velocity group, and a post um, peak height velocity group. And we wanted to just look at how muscle architecture differs across those three groups. Um, so just a big, big cross-sectional study. I think I had 150-ish kids um, from kind of local local schools, local clubs, and, and just looked at how, how are these muscle architecture measures changing as they get older. And what we found, unsurprisingly, was that kids muscles get bigger as they get older so we had increases in muscle thickness um, increases in penation angle and increases in um, physical length and um, for most of these guys looking at kind of like um, just penation angle and, and physical length there was um, kind of increases of around 10 to 20 percent from or sorry differences not increases because it was cross-sectional 10 to 20 percent differences between the post PHV group and the pre PHV group for like um, penation angle and physical length but for muscle thickness we were seeing these bigger um, kind of differences around 20 to 30 percent different um, between the post PHV group and the pre PHV group um, and then between kind of the pre and circa and circa and post groups, there was more of a kind of five to 10% change in inclination angle and physical length, but bigger or bigger differences in, in muscle thickness. Um, so around 10% in, in between pre and circa and circa and post. So that was initially just looking at what are, what are the differences in, in muscle architecture between these pre circa post PHP kids, just to get an idea of, kind of naturally developing kids, what, what changes should we expect? Um, because further down the line, once we know that, it's okay, is our training now actually giving us changes above and beyond that? Because if not, there's something wrong with your training program. So it was in, in that case, let's take a step back and let's just look at what, what the difference is. What kind of differences should we expect to see between different groups of, of um, maturity stages? And it was then, um, the kind of idea to look at more of a performance um, kind of point of view. Um, so actually starting to look at um, how does muscle architecture influence um, physical performance. So again, in a, in a cross-sectional study or a couple of cross-sectional studies, we looked at how um, how muscle architecture can actually influence uh, jumping performance and sprinting performance. So. For, for sprinting, we took the same, same muscle architecture measures again. So we had uh, gastrocnemius medialis and vastus lateralis, and we looked at muscle thickness, planation angle, and physical length. And we were correlating that with, for the sprints, we did uh, the force velocity profiling. 
Um, so coming out of that, kind of the main outcome we looked at was maximal sprint speed. And what we started to see was that actually it's it's uh, vastus lateralis phasical length. So um, kind of the, the phasical length of the knee extensors had uh, quite a weak correlation with, with the youngest group, so the pre-PHV kids, um, but it was still significantly correlated. Um, and then in the post PHP group, uh, it was a moderate correlation between VL physical length and, and maximal sprint speed. So it was this idea that there is obviously some benefit to, to physical length of the knee extensors in sprinting. And as you get older, that seems to become more significant. Um, and then in the jump stuff, looking at um, pre PHV, um, it was uh, kind of the strongest correlations were between the gastrocnemius medialis and um, forced time characteristics from a counter movement jump uh, in the younger group before shifting uh, in the circuit group to more um, of an emphasis from the vastus lateralis, so more of like a knee dominant kind of jumping strategy in that in that circa um, PHV group. Uh, before in the oldest group, the, the post PHV, the more mature guys. We started to see this this almost specialist role of the two muscles. So um, both GM muscle thickness and VL muscle thickness were correlated with most force time characteristics. So muscle thickness was important for jumping in this more mature group. But the other thing we found was that it was also the gastrocnemius medialis penation angle was important, as well as the physical length of the vastus lateralis. And we kind of know that penation angle is actually really important for kind of force development. So it's looking at this idea of, is it potentially the calf is more of like a force development, um, force producing action, whereas the knee extensors, the, the vastus lateralis, the quadriceps, was, was more of a um, kind of velocity movement with the importance of physical length that's going to help with contraction velocity. So in the, in the jumping or in the sprinting, we kind of see physical length is important and quadricep physical length becomes potentially even more important as, as kids mature. Um, and then in the jumping, we kind of see a, a shift from a, from a ankle based jumping strategy to a knee based jumping strategy as kids, as kids mature. And it was okay, cool, good. Uh, that started to look at underpinning mechanisms of, of, of sprinting and jumping, but it was now, well, let's, let's do a big longitudinal study. So we did a, a longitudinal study. Um, so it was a, an 18 month uh, kind of growth and maturation study where it was, let's just let the kids do what they do for 18 months. So um, we'll let them do PE, we'll let them play their sport, um, any unstructured SNC. They didn't have any structured SNC, but any unstructured SNC, it's hard to obviously control for that kind of stuff. And it was now, right, this is now, let's track these kids over 18 months and what actually happens. And uh, we split the kids into three different groups. So if they were pre-peak height velocity at the first testing and pre-peak height velocity at the second testing, we would call them pre to pre. If they were pre-peak height velocity at the start and post at the end, they would be pre to post. And then if they were post peak height velocity at the start and post peak height velocity 18 months later, they would be post to post. So we had three three different groups now, pre to pre, pre to post and post to post. With the muscle thickness stuff, what we found was that there's about a five to 10% change for those that were pre to pre. So quite a small change if they hadn't experienced their growth spur. If they experience their growth spurt in that 18 months, we start to see bigger changes. So around kind of 10 to 15 percent increases in, in muscle thickness. But then those kids that had already experienced their um, their growth spurt before we started the study. So those kids that were post at the start and post at the end, we actually saw about 20 to 30 percent increases in, in their muscle thickness. Um, so a lot bigger changes in these kids who had experience their growth spurt and it was like well cool like we've talked about that for years we've talked about how kids only start to see hypertrophic changes once they've gone through their growth spurt but we didn't really have any data so that was really neat that it kind of talked about um or kind of um established like what we thought we knew which was really cool um and then uh, the next part of that was also looking at well actually how does uh, kind of performance change as well? So looking at the sprint stuff and, and the jump stuff and 
And what we found was that um, the, the jump stuff, like kids who were pre to pre, um, had about a 6% change in, in something like jump height. Uh, kids who, again, who had experienced their growth spurt during the 18 months had about a 15% increase in, in jump height. And the kids who uh, were post to post, um, so had previously experienced their growth spurt before we started the study, had a 25% increase in jump height. So the same thing again of, of it seems to be kids who have experienced their growth spurt seem to have the largest changes in, in like jumping performance. And sprinting, slightly different. Um, so maximal sprint speeds, um, kids pre to pre, just a 3% increase in sprint speed. Um, for those who experienced their growth spurt with us, so pre to post, we had a 6% increase in max sprint speed. And then post to post, again, just a 3% increase. So again, it was just that idea of, well, okay, natural growth and maturation really does influence muscle structure, muscle architecture. So we see big increases in muscle thickness in, in these more mature kids um we see big increases in jump height of these more mature kids kind of 25 percent but sprint changes less than 10 percent uh, just showing us that actually for, for something like just natural growth and maturation it's not going to have a huge influence on sprint speed and um the kind of final takeaway from that longitudinal study was that um 80 percent of kids who uh saw a large change in uh vastus lateralis muscle thickness also had a large change in any force time characteristic or force velocity power um, change. So looking at actually, when we actually looked at the individual changes of, of muscle architecture and, and performance, it was the increases or the changes in vastus lateralis muscle thickness that seemed to underpin the changes in, in sprint speed and, and jump performance. And it was, well, hang on, that's a bit different to what we saw in the cross-sectional study, looking at the relationship, because I, I told everybody that VL physical length was really important. And it kind of came down to the fact that, well, VL physical length is important, but it doesn't change much. So it's almost like an innate quality. If you want to be fast, you need to have long vastus lateralis physical length, because they're not going to change much with training. Or, that, sorry, they're not going to change much with growth and maturation, whereas muscle thickness is going to change with growth and maturation and it might be those changes that actually drive performance changes so now fingers crossed next step is well, what does training add can we actually start to get bigger increases in, in muscle architecture can we get these changes in physical length with with different types of training because uh, that hasn't been done yet so that, that's going to kind of be next next step hopefully and that will be some really really cool cool studies that's really interesting because, I mean, I guess to put some layman's terms on it, you're basically answering the kind of nature nurture question a little bit, aren't you? And also all those youth athletes that we've seen succeed despite their coaches, perhaps not because of them. Um, yeah. Because effectively what you're saying is, do you know what? You could be a dreadful coach and you'll still get these sort of increases in your athletes because that's nature doing, doing, doing it for you. But if we're exactly. taking the credit, we might be in for a bit of a reality check. Yeah. And I think, I think it was needed. So, um, initially <laughs> don't get me wrong i've kind of framed this in quite a nice way but initially we wanted to do a training study i wanted to do a training study for my phd but it, it got to the stage where Rodri and john sat me down and went john you've been on your phd three years now like we, we've got to come to the end of this at some point and it was kind of like okay we might need to change a few things here so i can finish within five years um so don't get me wrong like the important things are the training stuff but like we didn't know what natural growth and maturation was doing yet. And I actually think it became a bit of a, maybe in hindsight, maybe a better PhD for me because I've almost answered the questions that people weren't looking at answering. It's actually, what does natural growth and maturation do to the athletes? Right, now we've actually got some measures in place of, of muscle architecture, of jump height, of sprint speed. Now we can actually go back to saying, well, do you know what? My program's all right. Like I'm getting 30% increases in, in uh, jump height, which is above what natural growth and maturation is going to give us. I'm getting 10% changes in sprint speed. Okay, cool. Like, but if you're not, 
we can revisit that and say, well, what's going wrong in the program? What, what do we need to look at? Because naturally just growth and maturation have probably given us that. So yeah, it, it was maybe a bit lucky that, that we ended up doing this, but I think it was very much needed. And now it's let's let's take the next step into, into actually looking at the training methods. Like we, we know what, what training is going to do to jump height and sprint speed in kids. And, and for us, it's, it's how does training influence muscle architecture and how does that influence the, the underpinning or how does that underpin sprinting and jumping? Mm. And obviously one of the, the other kind of avenues that you've, you've answered in, in separating your groups by maturation status rather than age groups is becoming a bit more specific around that question of, you know, if someone is a late developer, what sort of things might we expect if we gave them that extra 12 or 18 months to, to train in an academy yeah. or to do, you know, because we know they haven't, haven't had that opportunity that maybe some of our yeah. close PHP guys have. Absolutely. Like just looking at this and, and for, we don't necessarily like the word talent ID, but for those, well, like, we've all been there and seen it. Those kids who, who just haven't grown for for um, majority of their life and and are under 15, they're still smaller than anybody else. We, we can now take that to, to coaches and, and heads of academies and say, well, look, look at what naturally is going to happen to these kids if, if we just give them a bit more time. And this growth spurt seems to be such an important time frame, and, and we know that, but for me now, we've got data to support that, to say, look, you want this kid to be able to jump higher? Right, just give him another 12 months. As soon as he hits that growth spurt, it's gonna happen. Like you want this kid to sprint a bit faster? Okay, naturally that's gonna happen, but potentially let me do some training with him as well and we can start to enhance that. So I think it's been really important, yeah, just to just to take that step back and look at what is natural just growth. Every kid experiences maturation. We can't get away from that. Some people have bigger growth spurts. I'm still waiting for my growth spurt. And it's going to influence people more than more than others, but every kid is going to experience it. So to now know and to have data to show what natural growth and maturation is going to do is it's going to be decent. Hmm. And presumably the you know that time period of, of muscle um, thickness increasing would would line up around peak weight velocity as well. I would I would assume so. Yeah. So. Um, peak weight velocity normally about a year after peak height velocity. Um, so I, I don't know down now um, what kind of um, maturity stage or, or sorry maturity offset that the post PHB group were, but I would have thought it was all around kind of plus one um, years from peak height velocity. So more around that that peak weight velocity, and it was just quite nice to. We, we talk about it a lot and Rodri and John's uh, youth physical development model kind of started to touch upon it in a little bit more detail rather than just, uh, what was the first one? Was it Bali? Bali's model where they said, well, you can't train strength until after their growth spurt. And it's like, well, strength and hypertrophy are different things. There's been so much research out there that shows pre-PHB kids can get stronger but we know that might be neural changes versus structural changes once they've experienced growth spurt. And it was quite cool to actually find some of that as well and actually, again, put data to that to say, yeah, like it is like structurally, they're not going to get many structural changes at, at pre-PHV. It's all going to happen after their growth spurt. So. Hmm. so so, for, you know, the, the coaches, say sports coaches listening to this, what sort of takeaways or what applications do you think that should have maybe just from a, I guess, a thought process or a training process or anything? You know, if you were speaking to a sports coach, how, how might that change their perspective of a situation? I think I think you, you hit the nail on the head in, in this idea of um, almost giving, giving kids more time. Um, for me, for the academy managers or, or the, the selectors of squads, it is going to be that look this peak height velocity is such an important stage for key skills such as jumping and sprinting so if they haven't experienced that and you're telling me that they're not big enough they're not strong enough can we just wait can we just give them a little bit more time i think that's really important from a um kind of selection point of view um in terms of from from our point of view uh, like i said the, the biggest step for us was looking at can we actually get some thresholds for for what changes we expect to see. Um, I think that's important. I think we can take that to, to S&C coaches and say, look, you're working with kids. Well, growth and maturation are gonna get them big and strong anyway. So is your program above and beyond this? And, and that can hopefully promote some reflection to look at, oh, do you know what? I've, I've only got a 5% change in jump height. Um, like what, what's, what's happening here? So I think that can promote reflection to, to actually have those those thresholds. Mm -hmm. But this, this now is gonna, infer a little bit into some of the adult literature but but what we're starting to see is that um kind of heavy strength kind of traditional strength training 
is what drives changes in muscle thickness and pination angle, or is it more of like the high speed training uh, methods that actually uh, develop changes in physical length? So Anthony Blazevich um, has done a, a lot of work in in adults looking at kind of training um, training methods and, and muscle architecture. So if the same holds true for, for kids, and I'm not saying it will do, it's what we want to look at, but if it does, well, we need to give them this kind of varied stimulus then, because we're saying that muscle thickness is important for, for jumping and um, it's, it's gonna be what, the changes in muscle thickness are gonna be what underpin changes in sprinting and jumping. But then we're also saying that physical length is really important for, for sprint speed and for, for jumping performance in these older kids. So we also need to incorporate some training that's going to potentially increase physical length, which is going to be our higher speed stuff. So it's just looking at this kind of varied training stimulus where we can give them some heavy strength training, traditional strength training, combined with maybe some higher speed stuff, your ballistics, your, your throws, your jumps, um, and of course, some of your plyometrics. Um, and it's just under, it's kind of selling that message to, to coaches as well. And again, it's something that I don't think is going to be new for many coaches. This idea of we need a, like a varied stimulus for young kids. But it's now starting to get the rationale of why it's got to be that varied stimulus rather than just the natural rule. It, it gives them more tools and things. It's, well, it's actually developing adaptations that are going to influence your performance. And I think that's quite important. So, so yeah, we've, we've got the um, kind of education for the academy managers of let's just wait with some of these kids. Let's just let them experience their growth spurt. And I think that's why it's so important to track to track growth and to track height in, in academies so that we can see when the kids experience it because it is such a big part of physical development. Um, we can take this data to SNC coaches to say, this is naturally what's happening. Is your program above and beyond this? Because if not, you need to reflect and have a look at why not. And then inferring stuff, but hopefully we'll be able to start to answer these questions in the next couple of years. If we're looking at heavy strength training changes muscle thickness and, and speed training influences physical length, we need to give them this varied stimulus. Um, and I think I think the last thing is this idea of growth and maturation isn't, isn't going to change sprint speed much. And sprint speed's pretty important for most sports. And therefore we have to dedicate enough time to to actually develop in sprint speed. Um, and again, some of the adult literature is kind of chicken and egg stuff. Is it that sprinters sprint so their phas physical lengths are long? Or is it that they train and therefore they get longer physical lengths and therefore that they're faster? Uh, we don't know yet. So yeah, it's this other idea, like everybody wants faster athletes. So it looks like growth and maturation isn't gonna do much. We have to dedicate a little bit of time to, to actually training to get fast. I guess also that that message of patience kind of can play out in your training program as well. You know, obviously there's a sometimes a rush to get to get youth athletes strong, etc. And if we know actually, do you know what we know we're going to get these increases in, in muscle thickness, which we know are going to improve, you know, some some other metrics. Well, actually, the one thing that's not a given, if if you know those changes in muscle thickness and, and jump height potentially are a given, movement quality isn't a given. Is actually you're be maybe better off spending your time focusing on movement quality and allowing this stuff to happen in the background naturally and then when you know the things fall into place we've got all the kind of component parts to really go after getting strong and and muscle hypertrophy well, yeah exactly 100 percent. and i think it's, it's what we we promote uh where we coach and it's what we we promote to, to the students that, that we teach it's this fact that movement quality underpins everything and yeah, I think you're right. It's a really, really good point of if, if you're going to get stronger naturally, you're not going to move better naturally. So we need to actually dedicate a little bit of time to actually teaching kids how to move so that, like you say, when, when they do get that big increase in, in strength and power that, that is naturally going to come with, with growth and maturation, that we can enhance that with, with some decent training because they've got the underpinning movements, they're nailed down. Yeah. Hmm. So obviously you're, you're looking at doing a, a training study in the future to kind of answer some some other like leading questions. What, are, what other projects have you got going on or what other areas of interest that are popping up for you? Yeah, so yeah, that's that's the big one. Um, luckily, um, university have just bought me a new, I say, I say me, they bought the department a new, uh, a new ultrasound scanner, which, which is going to be great. Um, so we've got a new bit of kit, a really, really good kind of top end bit of kit where where we, we can start to look at some some more muscle architecture stuff and the big one is is the uh is the training um kind of the training studies uh 
the other stuff we want to look at we want to look at more like dynamic movement so all of my muscle architecture stuff was done in static movement so kids just lying on a massage bed and, and me scanning scanning muscles in a static position what we want to get to is what is happening to the muscle under contraction um so that's kind of the next one for us so uh, it's, it's, it's a big project. It's, it's going to combine um, kind of EMG, motion capture, ultrasound, force diagnostics, but it's needed. Um, it, it's like, there's, without discrediting my research too much, it's static images only show us a certain amount. It's actually what happens to the muscle while it's contracting is important. So that's a big one for us. And, and linked into that, I really want to start looking at uh, kind of what the role of the tendon is um my big area of interest is stretch shortening cycle and we know the tendon plays a massive role in the stretch shortening cycle uh one of my supervisors was was charlie war who's out in canada at the moment she's done a ton of tendon stuff um and she's come at it more from a, a growth and maturation natural development point of view so that's kind of been done already and it's like well we can try and jump straight in on the training studies um so we know tendons respond to load but what load is it just heavy strength training is it biometric load like so that's that's the next one so dynamic movement what's happening at the muscle in the dynamic movement but as well as what's happening to the tendon in dynamic movement and potentially some training studies around that um one big area that never gets looked at is females um they're very different to males especially once they they go through this uh, kind of growth spurt kind of males get this natural increase in, in their testosterone and, and therefore strength and power and females don't get that as much so I want to have a look at some of the muscle architecture stuff in, in females and hopefully uh, going to jump off of some of um, Silv's PhD research in a, in a young gymnasts and, and have a look at some of the kind of muscle architecture of the gymnasts which would be good. Um, so there are kind of big ones, the, the training studies, the dynamic movement and, and tendon stuff and uh, and some, some work in females would be good. Um, and just start to look at a bit more, trying to unpick this stretch shortening cycle that seems to be the, the natural kind of human movement, the natural muscle action, and just trying to learn more about, about some of that. So yeah, they're the, they're the next big projects. And you started doing a bit more around mentoring some, some other coaches, haven't you? Yeah, so it's it's uh, kind of a, a step I've taken into. It's it's more along the lines of my my teaching um, kind of direction. So um, I took a role uh, last year, uh, kind of leading on our disciplines uh, work based learning um, kind of role. And coming to the end of the PhD, I I wanted a new challenge as well. Um, I've kind of now I, I know I want to do more research. I, I've got questions that I want to answer um really exciting things um and it was a good time for me to kind of put coaching on hold for a bit um so I'm not not coaching at the moment but i need to keep my hand in something and, and this role came up and i thought yeah I, I need to get that so i can i can still influence so the kind of the idea of that role is is to create links with our local clubs uh create links with ngbs and look at look at placements um for our students so um, our undergraduate students on our on our sports conditioning rehab and massage um, course need to need to do a, a placement in third year, compulsory placement in third year, which I think is so important to try and get them some experience. Um, and we're trying to look at can we give them the best placements? Can we get them the best placements? So working closely with with kind of Cardiff City, um, Blues, uh, even things like Welsh triathlon, um, kind of. Uh, Welsh swimming so a, a range of different sports and looking at can we enhance their package that they give to our students because rightly or wrongly we, we talked about this at, at the start like universities are getting a bit of a bash in at the moment about not producing graduates that are ready for, for jobs and I think a lot of the universities are doing the best they can um, I think I might be biased but we run a fantastic program at program at Cardiff Met we've got some great people kind of above us and, and working within the team that we've developed a really good program um, so from an SNC point of view they're, they're coaching each other in their second year module um, a lot of their practicals are dedicated to coaching peers um, in third year they do a applied case study where they have to actually bring an athlete or an athlete uh, a, a mate of theirs along and, and they coach them through a, a 10 week program uh, with testing and monitoring throughout um, and we're, we're, we're making sure they get a placement and 
we're, we're doing everything we can to, to make sure our students are kind of job ready when they graduate, but there's only so much we can do. We, we, I think I sent a tweet the other day to somebody and it's along the lines of, we, we don't have access to everything to allow how the students to be job ready that's the idea of experience that they need to get in jobs so we don't have high performance teams that they can just work with um, we don't have a multidisciplinary team that they can work with so there's a lot of things as universities we can't do which we need the clubs to help us with and it's just trying to keep that relationship kind of alive and, and thriving like we we want to listen to what the clubs want of graduates because that's kind of the end goal for a lot of a lot of our students so we need to give them the skills that they can then take into their job but we need to know what are those skills so we need to listen to the to the practitioners and, and identify what are the key skills that our graduates need but we also need um the practitioners for us to say look we we, we can't have book smart kids we need to help them get experience which i think is where where placements come in so yeah, it's been a big part of my um, kind of uh, my role the last year and, and looking at developing uh, good placements for our students because that blend, taking them from their academic um, kind of learning um, through graduation and into, into roles, I see is really important and I see it as a big step and, and I think the more we can do for that, the better. And uh, kind of off the back as well, we're looking at helping clubs. So they're helping us, we need to help them. We're in a position where we can answer some of their kind of performance problems um so we're, we're trying to make links at the moment with with some of the clubs around around cardiff and a bit further where they can come to us with with their performance problems that we can help help them answer with um, with students kind of research questions and and some of our own research questions so we're just trying to find a bit of a, a, a mutually beneficial relationship between universities and clubs that i think is just so important um from from our point of view and i think the industry needs it because this is where the future future snc coaches are going to come from they're coming from universities so yeah i think both both sides of that need to need to keep keep pushing forward with it but most importantly work a bit more collaboratively for that mm, absolutely so for those who are interested in learning a bit more about i guess your, your kind of area or or you know any other resources on top of your head that you think are useful where would you signpost people be it coaches or students or I think um, I, I'm a I'm a big social media user. I use Twitter a lot. I'm not very vocal on there. Um, it's not really really my thing. I am vocal about Tottenham, unfortunately. And touch wood, it, it seems to be getting better. So there'll be less rants of how bad Tottenham are and how bad Jose Mourinho is. So um, I, it, it might be a little bit easier for people to follow me now. But um, I follow more people than than uh, me putting stuff out there. So for for youth stuff. Uh, Trying to think who's big on on Twitter that I follow. Jeremy Frisch, as long as you uh, make sure you understand the context, um, he seems to post a lot a lot of things around youth stuff. Um, our coaches, uh, Tom Matthews, is uh, he, he got better at using his social media, but he sends out some wicked stuff of, of videos of what his kids are doing, which is more of the structured stuff, um, and you'll still see they're having fun. The environment he creates is is fantastic. Um, Sylv Muscop, Steph Morris again they're not massive on social media but then we've got a, a YPD um, Twitter account that we're trying to get better at using none of us are that tech savvy and I'd, I'd like to say that we forget to tweet and video because we're coaching um, but that's, that's not always the case we just we just don't, don't seem to send to set, we don't seem to send tweets out but uh, that that's from us um, Craig Harrison does some great stuff um, and one of our PhD students Ben Pullen uh, is going along similar lines uh, Ben actually puts a lot on social media um, I didn't actually realize he was because he's someone I've been looking at the last few weeks going he's doing some yeah. interesting work but that makes sense now oh some wicked wicked stuff with with true like really like Rodri talks about it putting the kid at the center and that's all of what Ben's stuff is it's more than just SNC it's the full development he's doing a real big kind of cross-discipline multi-discipline PhD including some psych stuff and, and some um, like stuff in in schools and how it's affecting their school performance and his stuff's wicked he'd be great to great to speak to but mm. he's going down a similar route to Craig Craig Harrison with these kind of um like movement problems and movement challenges and and you can do them from home and i think he's got really into that in in lockdown and, and putting some really good stuff on his social media so ben and craig for some of that stuff um 
the, the podcast game has got big, um, like uh, looking at some of the guests you get on, some fantastic guests, re- really into, into youth stuff, which is good. Um, so obviously Rob Pacey has, has been there and, and, and done it, but I think to have a dedicated youth SNC podcast is really important. Um, so yeah, cracking job. Um, Rich Clark has also got his a little bit more of kind of a, a science um, kind of twist on a podcast he's looking at a bit more kind of just research dominated kind of stuff but with messages to practitioner um, so there's some of the podcasts and you can't go wrong with a good book so um, obviously very biased but Roger and John's book uh, second edition um, kind of just as good if not better than the first edition which just such a good resource for coaches it's it's so simple the the authors they got to write the chapters the books written so well they got it in a logical structure they've got template training programs it's a real like how to coach young athletes which is good and uh, they've got the big acsm textbook as well um i can't remember the time i should have a look this is probably just behind me essentials of youth fitness one that john and rodri wrote with with avery favor um which again is is a is a big big uh big resource so yeah there's some there's some smart people out there and, and the there's, there's stuff that, that I don't they're not I don't think they're massive on social media but the, the stuff that Des does with Arsenal um, and it pains me to say it being a big Tottenham fan but he seems to he just seems to get it and the guys who work with him at Arsenal seem to get it and I think the importance that he puts on getting the right people into youth s and is so important and it's it's difficult, obviously, because most clubs' money goes to the, the, the um, first team and, and the senior team, and it's difficult. But the way that he tries to look after the academy S and C coaches, um, I think he just sums it up. Like the best the best programs are the ones run by the best people, um, and there are so many good people out there working working with youth athletes who maybe aren't as well known as those working in in the in the big sports, and I think that's it's it's not a good thing uh, we need to we need to make these youth coaches who just want to work with youth coaches we need we need to make them a bit more higher profile because uh, that's what we want we want the best coaches working with youth so um i think it was it was yesterday when i, I listened to your latest podcast i had to look through some of your old guests and i thought wow like you're you're pulling out all the guys who should be known but aren't known um, and that's, I think that's what we need to do. We need to, we need to make these good youth coaches more high profile because, all right, it might not be the fancy big bucks and playing at Wembley, but it should be, it, it should be the best people should be working with the kids. So I think the more we can do to promote these, these good guys working, working with, um, working with the kids is, is important. So. Mm, definitely. So where can people find out more about you and your work? Obviously you've got your, your research gate profile. Where else can people find you? Yeah, so um, kind of research stuff goes up on ResearchGate. Um, I am on Twitter. I think my handle's John underscore Radner. Um, I, I debate sometimes putting more tweets out and then I realise I haven't got anything interesting to say. Um, so I <laughs> use more to follow people than, than to do anything. But if you really want to follow me on that, basically go on my profile and look at who I follow. We'll give you a better idea of, of who you can see. Um, I don't really use use anything else for for, for it. I'm, I'm not a big social media person, but if if anybody wants to wants to ask me anything, um, you can just send me an email. Um, look for my email on the Cardiff Met staff site and and send me an email. I'm always willing to chat to to um, kind of Zoom call with anyone that seems to be the way now. Um, I'm not doing as much coaching, but if they want to come down and, and see any of the other coaches when when we get back to a little bit more normality, uh, we can try and sort any of that out. So just because I'm not kind of open on, on social media, like if anybody wants to reach me, just, just send me an email or, or send me a tweet. Fantastic, John. Well, thanks so much for your time today. It's been a real treasure trove of information and, and some really good uh, things to take away and ponder. So thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Rob. It's been, yeah, it's been great. And yeah, looking forward to seeing uh, the rest of the people you get on because you're doing a, a, a great job of kind of promoting youth s and and it's it's much needed, which, which is good. So keep, keep up the good vibe.